Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India So welcome back friends, we are now into the second lecture on decision making and uh, as, as you know decision making is a complex uh, process, complex cognitive process. So it follows from reasoning and, uh, and judgment and so in the last lecture on decision making what we saw is what is decision making and so the definition that I provided you there is that decision making is basically a process of ma making a choice among a number of alternatives which have been given by the judgment process. Now when we make this choice uh, in, in decision making this generally happens in terms of or in, in the presence of some kind of a risk or some kind of a uncertainty and the reason that people make or the reason for these uncertainties that people make decision into is uh, the fact that people are humans that humans do not have all the information which is necessary for calculating a choice for calculating the effectiveness of a choice and so they tend to run into irrationality or irrationality of choices. Beside that we also uh, discussed the idea of something called the expected utility theory and uh, this expected utility theory which has been borrowed from uh, economics basically suggests that people's choice which, are, which should be rational or ideal uh, is basically dependent on the utility of a particular option and the probability of happening of this option. Now what do I mean by this? Now generally decision making models that we tend to study at, at this level are two in nature. The first kind of decision making model are called the normative models or the prescriptive models and the prescriptive models are those models of decision making which are supposed to be followed or which are supposed to be uh, utilized in making a decision. So given the fact that judgment has given us four or five different choices which are in front of us, the normative model provides us certain guidelines which needs to be followed for making choices. And um, if we follow and it is a guarantee that if we follow these guidelines the choice always will always be rational. Now what is a rational choice? A rational choice is the one which give which guarantees the attainment of a final goal and it gives us the maximum gain or it maximizes our gain and also minimizes our losses. So it is a choice in which the gain uh, the chances of gains are there but then the chances of losses are very uh, minimum and so rational choices are those choices which provides maximum utility in the presence of maximum probability of occurrence of an event. Now in expected utility theory the idea of expected utility theory says that cho those choices which provide us the maximum utility and uh, uh, for a particular option and uh, with the availability the highest probability of that option happening is the most rational choice. What do I mean by this? Given the fact that there are 4 or 5 different choices which, uh, which come out of a particular cognition, now what we tend to do is rate the utility of each choices. Each choices present a certain goodness or present a certain benefits and certain downside of it. So what we tend to do is look at the benefit of each choice and the downside of it and equate them. This is called utility or the, the, the use of a particular choice. With that each of this option will also have a probability of occurrence. For example, some of these uh, uh, choices tend to occur more frequently than the other number of choices or the other kind of choices. So an irrational choice or uh, according to the expected utility theory, the rational choice will be a choice which has maximum occurrences, the highest probability of occurrences and also the highest expected utility. Now given the fact that some choices have very high utility and very low uh, probability we should not make these choices, we should only make those choices which, which has a decent amount of probability of occurring and also give us a decent amount of utility. 
utility. So, if a choice has highest probability of occurring, but it gives us the very low utility, we should not choose this choice. On the other hand, if a choice has highest utility and lowest occurrence, we should not make that choice. A rational decision maker will make a choice which gives them uh, a certain level of um, uh, utility and also a very good level of probability of occurrence. And so, this is what the expected utility theory really works. Now, the problem is this expected utility theory are always violated by humans. The reason being that humans do not have enough information are not calculators, not statisticians to calculate all the options on which to be the choices to be made. And so, they go under or they violate these principles of expected utility and they create violations of them. And one of the violations that we discussed in the last class is called preference reversal, which basically means that if, if people tend to prefer choice a in certain situation, they reverse their choice in certain situation B or C. Now, the preference reversal theory says that if somebody likes choice A or somebody likes option A better than B, then no matter how the situation changes, he should stick with A. But then as humans, we do not stick to that, we keep on changing our preference uh, from situation to situation. And so, this is a violation of the expected utility theory. Now, why does this happen? The reason I have given before, this happens because humans do not have all the information which is necessary for making the computations and neither even if they have the information, they are lazy or they have some kind of a deficiency in organizing all this information and coming up with the best choices. And so, humans then do not follow the normative or the prescriptive model of generally do not follow the prescriptive model of decision making. So, then what do they follow? They follow a model of descriptive model of of uh, decision making. What is the descriptive model? The descriptive model of decision making is a model which generally humans follow while making decisions and it has uh, it, it at times tends to give irrationality or, cho or choices of irrationality. So, people then tend to make choices which are of low yield and tend to then suffer. And so, this this kind of people's choice making or people's decision making are not always rational, they are irrational and sometimes this irrationality is not too much of a harm to people. And so, one of the theories which has been proposed by the uh, Nobel Prize winner Travesky and Kahneman in 1979 was called the prospect theory. This is a descriptive model of decision making and it takes into account of the fact that humans are different from computers and they do not generally have uh, these expected utilities and probabilities combining and making decisions onto it. So, then let us look at what is prospect theory. Now, one of the popular alternatives to the expected utility theory is provided by Nobel Prize winner Daniel Kahneman with his colleague and Amos Trevesky in 1979 and which is called the prospect theory. What is the prospect theory say? Now, the prospect theory is a descriptive model of decision making that attempts to describe how we make decisions and why our decisions violate the expected utility model. And so, what is the statement of this theory? The statement of this theory says that decisions are not valued based on an absolute value of the end result. The way we make decisions generally are not valued, its utility is not valued as in terms of what the end result would be or what the final value attained after the decision choices should be. Uh, but this theory as proposed by expected utility theory. Instead, we value decisions based on the amount of gain or loss from what we have right now. So, people do not look at decisions or people do not look at the utility of a decision or the, uh, the desirability of a decision uh, in terms of the end value, in terms of the final value that you are going to get. But people make decisions in terms of the value that they are going to get from where they are, from the reference point of where they are. So, people make uh, these value decisions in terms of the amount of gain or loss that they are going to have from the point of time or from the point where people are right now. So, let us take that, uh, take the fact that if playing a gamble gives you 10 rupees and if you lose that or if you do not, uh, if you win that gamble you get 10 rupees, if you lose that gamble you get, uh, you lose 10 rupees. Then uh, in terms of expected utility theory, the 10 rupees is the final value and so that is what the decision criteria should be followed on to that. But then we as humans, we decide this, this 10 rupees, the value 10 rupees is not the uh, same value on which we make decisions. What we tend to do is given the fact that if you have 5 rupees in your pocket, what you tend to do is that the expected value or the expected value of this outcome then becomes 5 rupees because, is, because if you have 
if you lose still you will have 5 rupees which is with you and so it does not matter too much. So, from where you are standing from there you look at the final price. So, winning 10 rupees when you have 5 rupees is not that lucrative in terms of the fact that if you lose that 10 rupees right and so that is the difference which is there. So, in terms of prospect theory what people tend to do is make these evaluations of final value of an outcome not based on uh, the final value from the starting point, but from the reference point from the point of how much they have at the point of making a decision. So, when you are making a decision at that point of time how much um, good that you have or how much uh, backup that you have from there we make the assessment of gains and losses onto any gamble. It also uh, uh, adds that gains and losses are on different scales of value. So, one thing that the, pro uh, that the prospect theory says is that people do not uh, make evaluations of gains and losses right from uh, the beginning to the end value of a gamble of a end value of a decision, but what they tend to do is these decisions are based, uh, based on the fact that how much people have previously uh, or people uh, how much good people have before they make a decision. So, somebody who has money and who is gambling he will gamble more or less depending on how much money he has, but somebody who has no money in he, his choices will be different. So, people do not make this kind of a calculations in absolute terms, but rather from a reference point. The second prediction of the prospect theory is that the gains and losses are on different scales of value. For example, the scale of value the in terms of gains people perceive gains as uh, lower value, but losses as higher value. So, losing 10 rupees note uh, gives you more losses or lets you feel that you have lost more than in terms of gaining 10 rupees. Given the fact that if today morning you get a 10 rupees note from somewhere you the amount of happiness that you get will not be equivalent to the fact that if you lose 10 rupees uh, in, at some point of time. So, the amount of feeling the amount of happiness the amount of happiness of the gain will not be equivalent to the sadness that you get out of losing that value. And so, this is the kind of th things or this is the kind of prediction that the prospect theory actually goes ahead and predicts. Now, the value attached to gain increases more slowly as a function of the size of the gain than does the negative value we place on the loss as a function of the size of the loss. And so, what it basically says is that the gain as the amount of gain increases the function of gain increases very slowly. So, larger gains will slow will show you uh, smaller increase in happiness whereas, even smaller losses will show larger increase in sadness. So, if even so if, if you gain 50 rupees the amount of happiness that you get and if you gain 100 rupees the change in happiness from gaining 50 rupees and 100 rupees will be sharply in contrast to the fact that if you lose 10 rupees and if you lose 5 rupees in terms of the drop in terms of uh, the sadness that you get in losing 10 rupees uh, then in 5 rupees the drop is very sharp that then in terms of gains. So, people will be more or less same happy when they gain 100 rupees and 50 rupees, but if they lose 5 rupees and 10 rupees the amount of different sadness that they feel will be more and that is what one of the predictions of this particular theory is. Now, basically what this theory says is that we feel losses more at acutely than we feel gain. And so, as humans uh, in terms of expected utility theory if we gain 10 rupees or if we lose 10 rupees the value of that money is still 10 rupees, but then and so we should feel the same amount of happiness and sadness, but as humans we know that losing money gives us more pain and so losses are more dramatic or gives us more sadness then if you gain 10 rupees and that is one of the more predictions. So, we feel more losses um, acutely. So, uh, the losses are felt more accurately than we feel gains. Now, the psychological pain associated by losing a dollar 50 is greater than psychological pleasure of gaining a 50 dollar and that is the basic concept or that is the basic standpoint of the prospect theory as against the expected utility theory which says that gains and losses in, in terms of value. So, if 50 rupees is lost or 50 rupees gain in both of them the expected utility that we get or the rational choice uh, rational decision maker will not be hindered by his preferences. But, prospect theory says that if 50 rupees is lost 
we feel more sad and we do not want to spend more money out of it. But if we gain 50 rupees, we are not that much happy and so this is the invariance which is there or this is the kind of difference which is there. Now, prospect theory predicts that people will be especially aversive to losses and will show differences in preference depending on how alternate views are presented or framed. So, basically another interesting feature of this prospect theory is the fact that people do not like losses, they are aversive to loss. So, people do not like losses at all and so given the fact that if two options, if a particular option is framed differently, is worded differently, people will change their preferences. So, if an option has a gain frame, which means that it, uh, it talks about everything with certainty, people will have a different kind of a, a response or people will choose a different kind of an option. Whereas, if something is framed in a, a negative sense or something talks about losing some statement talks or some options talk about losing, people will have an entirely different option to choose from. And this basic fact is called framing. So, look at this graph. This graph basically says that this is the reference point, and in terms of these are the losses, and these are the gains, and this is the value. So, in terms of value, if you, you see that for higher values, as the value goes high, the gains are very less, but then even for very smaller values, the loss drop is very high. So, people in general they do not like losses and losses are perceived as bad, losses are perceived as aversive, people want to avoid losses and people, but on the other hand gains even if a very high amount of money is uh, given to you, you gain a high amount of money, you will not become happy. So, the amount of happiness that comes with gains is not equivalent to the amount of sadness which comes with losses. So, couple of facts to be remembered, one is this, the other the fact to remember is that people hate avoiding uh, uh, going into losses and so there are different scales of it and the third thing is that if framed differently, if uh, the same option is framed differently, people are presented differently, people reverse their choices. So, then let us look at something called framing. What is framing? Framing is the term which is used to describe the effects. On, on our decisions of how a scenario is presented. Let us say an option is given to you and the presentation of the option is reworded. One, uh, so something uh, and let us say the option of uh, uh, winning a 50 rupees or win or, or, or let us say that there is a particular decision that has to be made and out of this decision certain kind of choices are uh, certain kind of alternatives come up. Now, these alternatives can be framed in a gain frame which means that everything is positive or it can be or everything uh, that the alternatives talk about is certain or it could be in a loss frame in the sense that everything that the alternatives talk about is uncertain in nature and in those cases people tend to reverse their preference. So, prospect theory it predicts that our preferences will change whenever our reference point changes. If we are in a green frame, if we are doing evaluations, if we are choosing alternatives and options in a green frame, then in those cases the kind of decisions that we make and if we are doing evaluations, we are choosing options in a loss frame, those two decisions will be different. The reason being that gains are taken in uh, in a different in, in a different way than losses, gains are not that pleasant as losses are to more sadness. So, decisions can be influenced by how information is presented and this is what is framing. Framing is basically using a say statement or basically reframing, rewording a particular option. Now, if information is presented in terms of a positive or a gain frame, we will be more likely to avoid risk, we will be risk aversive and pick up a sure bet. So, if something is given to or some option is given to us in a gain frame, in a positive frame or in a, with certainty that something is going to happen, we are we become risk aversive. So, in terms of the fact that if certain options are given to us which show certain amount of certainty, which have a gain frame, which has some positive outcome out of it, we tend to avoid losses in those cases as against those. So, however, if the same information is presented in a negative frame, in a loss frame, a certain amount of information is given to you or certain information which is available in a particular option is in a loss frame, which means that a certainty, a certain level of certainty is not provided to you, we will be taking more risk. So, people take more risk when a loss frame is there, when people know that something is negative, when people know that they are losing, they take more risk. But when people know that they are gaining, 
where people know that there is no loss to it, people always select sure bets. So, this is what framing is all about. So, it is all about how do we go ahead and make this kind of a choices or this kind of a thing. So, in a gain frame, people avoid risks right and they become risk aversive in a loss frame in a frame where people know that certain kind of losses are there people take more risk. So, people become more risk prone people take more risk in terms of negative frames in terms of negative situations in terms of positive situations people always prefer a sure bet. Consider a, uh, so I am presenting a study by uh, a very famous uh, study by Travesky and Kahneman in 1981, and this is, a, this is available everywhere. And this study, what it does, it is, is a sample study to show that framing has its effect, or framing can lead to this reversal of um, preferences among people. And so, what is this subject? In this particular study, subjects were shown two different kind of options which was there. So, two different kind of options are presented to or two different scenarios are presented to people. Let us look at the option. So, the option scenario says that imagine that the United States is preparing an outbreak for an unusual Asian disease. So, basically this is what it is now which is expected to kill 600 people. So, the situation says that United States is basically uh, preparing a, uh, a situation or preparing themselves for an Asian outbreak of disease where they have all only calculated that 600 people are going to die. Now, two alternative programs for combating the disease have been proposed. So, there are two options for combating this disease are there. So, 600 people are going to die no matter what this is the certainty with it. Now, assume that the exact scientific estimate of the consequence of the program is as follows. So, there are two scientific options, there are two scientific estimates there, there are two options to look at and then you have to choose which are the option you would like to go with. Now, if you adopt program A. 200 people will be saved. If program B is adopted, there is one third probability that 600 people will be saved and two third probability that no one will be saved. This is one way, one thing to be looked at. So, 600 people were going to die out of it and so two programs induced to save more number of people. In option A, in using the option A, what happens is that there is sure sort fact that 200 people are going to be saved if program A is adapted, but if program B is adapted, then there is one third of a probability that 600 people will be saved and two third of a probability that no one will be saved. This is one option. So, one group of subjects were presented this kind of an option. Another group of subjects were presented a similar option and they were asked to make the choice whether they will go with program A or program B. Now, in the other group of subjects were presented a similar kind of situation in which a it was stated that program C is adopted 400 people are going to die, but if program D is adopted one third probability that nobody will die and two third probability that 600 people will die. Now, look at these two options which are there. So, basically the situation is that there is a scenario which has been presented, the US is suffering from some kind of an attack, 600 people are expected to be die, dead and so they create a hypothetical programs to hypothetical situations for combating with these diseases and so these are the options. So, as you look into it, the first option, the first two options program A and B given to first kind of subjects as in a, in a gain frame and in the C and D are in the loss frame what do you expect to happen? What really happen is that when things are presented in the gain frame, most people select option A, which is 200 people will be saved rather than selecting program B, which says that one third probability that 600 people will be saved and two third probability that no one will be saved. But look at this, look at the C and D option. It is presented in a loss frame and here it says that if C adopt is adopted, 400 people are going to die. And where D is adopted, one third probability that nobody will die and two third probability that 600 people will die. If you look into it, there is no change from A to B, right? It is the same. But if provided in the gain frame, people select option A, whereas if provided in the loss frame, people adopt D as the answer. And this happens, this shift or reversal of choosing D over C 
or choosing A over B is from the fact that it is framed in a different way, it is pre presented in different uh, positive or negative frames. So, in a positive frame people select those options which present certainty. So, 200 people save certain thing I will go with it, but the fact that if it is a loss frame if 400 people are going to die unknown why not go with the rescue option which says that one third probability that nobody will die. So, one third probability that nobody will die is going to be the same thing it is not going to be different in any way 200 people is what is the one third probability that is there. And so, people select D option whereas, in the first case people select A option and this basic demonstration shows that people show this kind of a preference reversal or reversal of choices or reversal of which options to go with depending on which frame it is being presented to. Remember the invariance theorem which comes from expected utility theorem it says that if people select A in first case they should select C in the second case although they are the same, but that is not what happens people reverse their choices and this happens because these options have been presented in different frames or in different wordings in a gloss frame and in a gain frame. So, in a gain frame in the first case what happens is people become more risk aversive they do not want to take risk. So, they go, go with the certainty option they go with the option where 200 people are going to be dead, but in case where is a loss frame people go with a more risky option they take more risk. So, although the, even, even if you calculate it is going to be the same. So, take a more risky option and in this case they take the D option which is more risky, but it is going to they think that it is going to save more people, but it is almost the same and that is an very very interesting finding of this prospect theory which says that gains and losses are valued differently or they are seen or perceived differently by people. Now, another interesting phenomena or another interesting output of the prospect theory is something called psychological accounting. It is another interesting output of the prospect theory or one of those features or one of those ways in which people make decisions. And what is it says? So, this principle says that people will make different choices depending on how the outcome is felt or perceived. Basically, how people feel. So, it is about feeling, it is about emotion, it is about how people like a particular option. So, the way they feel about an option that decides how people are going to make the decisions and so people uh, feeling about a particular option makes the final choice of the decision and not the utility. So, people do not go ahead and make statistical calculations of probability and utility in making decisions rather what they do is they use a heuristic approach of how they feel about a particular choice and based on that they make the decision and actually make the choices of what to do with and they consider that to be rational. Now, look at there are two situations which I have presented to you to explain psychological accounting. First, first of all let us look at the first case. Now, imagine that you decided to see a play for which dollar 10 a ticket and you enter the theater you discovered that you have lost dollar 10 bill. Would you pay 10 dollar for the ticket to the play? The, so, the first option is that you have lost a 10 dollar bill which means that you have lost the money. And so, you enter into a theater you want to go see a movie you enter a theater and then in after entering a theater you lost a 10 dollar thing which is the also the cost of the ticket. So, are you going to pay for the ticket are you going to buy the ticket. And there is a such a second situation in which decided you decide to see a play for which admission is 10 dollar as you enter the theater you discover that you have lost the ticket. So, you bought the ticket and now the ticket is lost the seat was not marked and the ticket cannot be recovered there is no the since you bought the ticket the seat and, and unfortunately the seat are not marked and there is no way to recover the ticket would you pay 10 dollar for a ticket for the play. So, in which of these chances in which of these cases are you more happier or are you more likable to buy a second ticket what is the answer what do you think is going to happen. Now, given the fact that if these are the choices which have been presented it has been found that choice 2 in choice 2 people are more reluctant people do not want to buy a new ticket. The reason being that they believe that 10 dollar the value 10 dollar although the ticket has a 10 dollar value the 10 dollar has been already assigned to the ticket. And so, is if the ticket is lost there is no point in buying a ticket because the 10 dollar from the psychological money account that they have that has which was assigned to the ticket has been lost. But in the first case 
the idea the 10 dollar bill the 10 dollar uh, rupees or the 10 rupees for which the ticket is worth that got lost. And so, the, the probability of losing a 10 rupees is far greater than the probability of losing a ticket to a particular play which is of 10 dollar. And so, the fact that in, in case 1 in the first option you are more likely to go ahead and buy the ticket than in the second case because here the value of 10 has been assigned to the ticket and the ticket has been lost. And so, the value 10 has been uh, assigned to the ticket and the, in your psychological accounting says that I do not want to pay more money to this particular ticket. And so, this is what Daniel Kahneman and Trevesky also found out. In Kahneman and Trevesky 1981 original study, the subjects were less willing to purchase a ticket in scenario 2. Now, why could this be? This could be because of the fact that the 10 dollar that they spend in option 2 will be from the ticket option from the psychological account which is assigned to the ticket. Where in the first case the probability of losing a 10 dollar is very high. So, even if you lose a 10 dollar bill it, it could have been lost anywhere and so you will buy a ticket. But in the second case the ticket which was for the, uh, for the 10 dollar the ticket was lost and so the value was assigned to the ticket and so since you have lost the ticket you are not going to put any more money onto it and so this is called the psychological accounting. Another interesting fact or another interesting phenomena which is a follow up of psychological accounting or prospect theory is something called sunk cost. It is another feature or another phenomena which shows how people show irrationality in making decisions they are not rational decision maker. And so, what is sunk cost? Now, in the sunk cost effect is another interesting variation of the notion of psychological accounting. What does he say? This effect was demonstrated by Arkes and Bluner in 1985 in one of their experiment. And so, let us look at the experiment. So, in this experiment what happened is subjects were to imagine that they purchased tickets for two different ski trips. So, basically two different ski trips were there and subject uh, actually brought ticket for both these trips. Now, one ticket a trip for Wisconsin costed 50 dollar while the other ticket was a trip to Michigan which costed a 100 dollars. Now, the scenario made it clear that the trip to Wisconsin was preferable because it would be more enjoyable. So, basically then there are two trips that you buy a ticket to a ski trip one is to Wisconsin and the other is, uh, is to Michigan. The Wisconsin uh, cost of the Wisconsin ticket is 50 dollars, the cost of the Michigan ticket is 100 dollars, both are ski trips that are there, but then this information is provided to you that the Wisconsin trip is more desirable, it is more fun and so it is more preferable. So, now you have decided to go to both the places. Now, comes a complication. Where is the complication? A complication arises where the two trips fall on the same weekend. Now, unfortunately, both the trips tend to come on the same weekend or the same dates and the tickets are non-refundable. You cannot go ahead and refund a particular ticket. My question is which of the tickets are you preferring to go to or which of the trips are you going to uh, go to and which is the trip that you are going to avoid. Now, rationality suggests that Wisconsin trip is more exciting although it is of lower value. So, people should go for this one and leave the trip to Michigan which is expensive 100 dollars, but is that what happens? No, this is exactly the opposite of it. People actually prefer the non enjoyable trip because it is expensive and so people actually go to the Michigan trip and so this is what the result of Emerson Trevesky's or Arkin's uh, main study is that they found out that people take the Michigan the Michigan trip although it is non enjoyable, but it is expensive. And so, p this, this is the phenomena which is also seen in everyday world where we, what we see is that people throw in uh, money after bad money. So, if people lose money they tend to throw in more money. So, if there is something that you have which is not working and so when you see that this thing is not working and you put more money into it for it being repaired and it does not get repaired you tend to put more money onto it. People do not get into it. So, some if you buy a particular product it gets defective you give it to someone for repair. Now, after repair it is still not working you tend to put more money into it to getting repaired rather than buying a new thing because it has already costed you more and so you tend to make some more money onto it. And this is the exact same phenomena here happens people tend to put more money onto the expensive option 
behind the expensive option rather than choosing an option which is more enjoyable but lesser value. So, these are what is uh, this is to do with what is prospect theory and how does prospect theory really works. Another interesting theory or another interesting fact in decision making is the role of affect in decision making or the role of emotion in decision making. So, positive and negative outcome or positive and negative effect which comes with an outcome the feeling of goodness or badness which comes uh, with an outcome they uh, gave us different different feelings with us and with predictable implications on decision we make. So, our decisions are not just in terms of factual information, it is also related to the kind of feeling that we get after taking a particular decision, after taking a decision or after choosing a particular alternative, how do we feel about that alternative also plays a large role or plays a major role in how people make decisions or how decision making is done. So, effect thus is an important determinant of decision making and can have a a sizable impact on psychological accounting process. So, it is basically the feeling that you have the kind of pleasure or pain that you get out of taking a decision that depends or that decides a lot about how you take decisions. Now, Hasse and Rotten Stage 2004, they made this point by highlighting an important dimension of choice that interacts with effect which they term as scope. They basically came up with this dimension of choice which interact with effect and we, they called it the scope which refers to the sweep of a decision or action, how much impact will it have. So, basically Hattie and, Rot and uh, Rotten Stitch in 2004, they invented or they came up with the whole, this uh, whole new dimension which is called scope which refers to the sweep of a decision. How do sometimes decisions are made in terms of sometimes of positivity or negativity or sweep and this is what they discovered. So, consider these particular two things. Suppose you give 10 dollars to save one endangered tiger, it feels good. Now, how much would you give to save four such endangered tigers? Given the fact that you often see people coming to you saying that see these kind of animals are endangered, they have to be saved in some way and so we need some kind of a money from you to save these. So, if they then they show you some basic thing give us uh, 10 dollars and we, we are going to save some endangered animal out of it, let us say panda, tiger or whatever it is and so you give some kind of money into it. Now, the fact that for one it is ok, but then he says that you are going to save 4 tigers, are you going to pay more that is the question. Now, how much are you going to shell out for end saving 4 endangered tigers or what is the way in which your decision process really works. The answer to this question, so if you are giving 10 dollars for saving 1 tiger, whether you are going to give 40 dollars for saving 4 tigers is the question and so the answer to this depends on whether the subjective value you derive from saving tigers is somewhat multiplicative. So, basically the kind of so, value that you derive that or the kind of utility that you derive by saving tigers how much that is. So, is it multiplicative or not? So, saving one tiger if you are and so this basic the decision depends on two different modes of decision making. So, basically if one tiger requires 10 dollars for saving and if somebody asks you to save 4 tigers are you giving 40 dollars for saving the tiger and that depends upon how much utility or how much subjective value you derive from saving these 4 tigers. Now, the author proposes a dual process view of the relative impact of scope and subjective value on decision making. They say that people make this kind of decisions under two different modes of decision making and what is this mode? There is a particular mode which is called the deliberative mode in the which map onto the conscious reasoning. So, when you are into a deliberative mode or when you are into a conscious mode of reasoning then then if somebody says that saving 1 tiger is 10 dollars, saving 4 tigers 40 dollars, then you would provide 40 dollars because you reason that 1 tiger will require 10 dollars of saving then 4, 4 tigers will be 10 into 4 which is 40. But if you are functioning onto an effective mode, if you are functioning into one of those in, in a way that you feel good about saving tigers, then saving 1 tiger is enough for you. And so, if you are functioning into an effective mode which would map onto an unconscious reasoning, in this case you say that I do not care, I have said tiger that is the answer and so one tiger be it one tiger or four tigers I have saved an endangered species and so 10 dollar is more than enough and in those cases you do not shell out more money. So, in a deliberative mode you are more prone to giving more money because you do more calculations and it maps out to the conscious part of the brain and so you tend to shell out more money because you do a calculation. But if it is the feeling which comes with the decision of saving tiger if you feel good by just saving tiger if that is the underlying 
underlying uh, meaning out of it then whether it is 1 or 4 it does not matter and so in those cases you are take a different kind of decision altogether. So, when we are in a deliberate decision making mode we value things by calculating 4 is greater than 2 and so saving 4 is much better than 2 while when we are in an effective decision making mode we value things by feeling help tiger. So, saving 1 tiger is helping tiger and saving 4 tiger is helping tiger. So, whether I say 1 or 4 is basically the feeling which is out of it. It is not that some when you say 4 tigers the feeling will be greater it is not multiplicative, but when we are in a deliberative mode we understand that saving 1 tiger and saving 4 tigers or saving 2 tigers and 4 tigers 4 tigers is more than 2 tigers. So, let us give more money and so their decision will be based on that kind of an imperative or that kind of a, a system, but when in an effective mode once you are in an effective mode it is the feeling which is of interest to you it is the fact it is the pleasure that you get when you save a tiger, it is the kind of appreciation that you get when you save a tiger and that is all it matters. So, it does not really matter whether you are saving one tiger or you are saving four tigers and so it is saving tiger which is of importance to us. So, in deliberate decision making mode as scope increases subjective value increases corresponding while in effective decision making mode scope does not uh, matter nearly as much as affected by the presence or absence of a stimulus. So, scope is basically the sweep of the decision. So, in the deliberative mode. Uh, the scope has very less value than in the effective mode it is all about the scope which is out there and so people's decision making then vary in terms of whether they are in the deliberative mode or in the effective mode and the decisions are affected by the kind of feeling that they generate. In the effective mode it is the feeling which uh, basically decides what kind of uh, decision that you are going to make or what kind of imperative that you are going to use or what kind of um, uh, decision options that you are going to do but in terms of the deliberative mode it is quite different. And so, this is the last uh, uh, section onto our course on cognitive psychology uh, and in terms of decision making. So, basically what we did in this particular uh, class is that we saw a extension of one of the popular theories of uh, decision making and this is the descriptive theory. So, in the earlier class what we did in the earlier lecture what we did we looked at a class of theories which is called the normative or prescriptive theories which work in terms of reasoning and rational decision makers or ideal decision makers and it, it is called the expected utility theory or it, call, it is called the multi uh, attribute uh, utility theory. Both these theories work on the fact that decision making is basically done in terms of what is the utility of a particular option chosen a particular option and what is the probability of that option coming in and multiplying this gives us the final basis on which an option should be chosen. These are the prescriptive theories or these are the normative theories which are there. We saw that human beings since they do not have a lot of information available to them and even if the information is available to them they cannot be working as calculators or mental computers. So, they make irrational choices or irrationality and this irrationality basically happens because human beings have certain limitations and so we as humans follow a descriptive theory or more um, uh, worldly theory of decision making and one of these theories of decision making which is descriptive in nature is something called the prospect theory. So, what is the prospect theory? The prospect theory is a theory which basically goes ahead and says that gains and losses that people have have different values. So, gains are uh, higher gains have lesser pleasure lower losses have more pain into it. So, gains and losses come in different frames they are evaluated in different frames and gains and losses are uh, thought of differently. Also prospect theory proposes the fact that losing and gaining are basically dependent on the frame in which a particular option is presented. So, if a particular option is presented in a gain frame then people's choices will vary whereas, if a particular option is presented in a loss frame the people's choices will also vary according to it. So, reversals of preferences or reversals of choices of option depend on which frame the information is presented. In gain frame people are more risk averse. people do not want to take risk people always select uh, certain options. Whereas, when something is in a loss frame people are risk taking they like risk they take risk and so once uh, something is in a negative frame or in a loss frame people want to take risk and put more risk into it and so that is the kind of decision making that they tend to take. 
and then we discussed two other outputs out of it or two other phenomena related to the prospect theory. One is called psychological accounting. It says that how you feel about a particular situation, how you feel about a particular option makes you decide whether you like that option or not in contrast to whether it is multiplicative or it is whether uh, things are uh, rational or not. So, it is the basic feeling that people get of, out of it. The second uh, the option or the second uh, output to it or the second theory to it was the sunk cost theory which says that people always what they tend to do is they take the non desirable option they always put more money after the bad option. So, if, even if something cost more people tend to take the more unlikable or the more unenjoyable journey because people put more money onto sunk money that is the way that they like. So, they do not do these calculations given the fact that if they calculate they will always go for the lesser enjoyable trip, but they tend to go to the more higher trip which has higher money to it because they think that since larger money has been there let us go with this thing that is one of the things. Now, in the last section of this particular lecture we saw how effect of or basically how getting a pleasing or a, a non pleasing feeling out of a decision basically helps you into decision making or basically helps you into making decisions. And so, we found out that when people have uh, are in a deliberative mode, people are in a conscious mode, then they tend to do this calculative and they are more helping. It is not about feeling that they think about, it is not about uh, the effect which decides, which helps them decide a particular uh, decision which, uh, which uh, does not rule the decision, but when people in an effective mode the kind of decision that they tend to take is entirely different and, and they are affected by the sweep or the scope of the decision. So, basically effect then itself has a major role to play. Now, in terms of brain physiology it has also been found that this risk options of framing has been uh, proved or the, the, the effect of framing on decision making has also been proved in terms of certain uh, brain studies. So, in certain brain studies it has been it was found that people who were presented uh, options in a positive frame. So, if some option was given to them in a positive frame uh, people selected uh, and when uh, in a positive frame people selected those options which were certain the brain activity was very less. So, in if things were in off, if an option if an alternative was presented in a positive frame and people selected certain options people selected those options which were not presenting risk people showed lesser brain activity then if they selected those options which presented some kind of a risk on non certain options. In contrast to this, so basically less activity was there when they selected certain options the, then if they selected those op options which were non certain in a positive frame, but in a loss frame it was quite the opposite. In a loss frame when people selected those options which were risk producing less brain activity was there than people when people selected those options which were certain. So, in a loss frame risk taking led to lesser activity of the brain and more calmer activity of the brain which means that decisions were more thought through, decisions were more liked through. Then in cases in, in the other case in the positive frame where certain option selections or selecting those options which were certain which were trying to which were very uh, uh, definite which were very certain or which were sort of very um, uh, fixed those in those cases the activity of the brain was less and the brain was much calmer than selecting those options in which it was not uh, the, in this the option was not certain. So, in this way human beings make decisions and in this way human beings produce decisions or make decisions and, and uh, they differ from calculative machines or economic decision making. So, basically using these processes of decision making either using the prospect theory or using the other things human beings come up with decisions and then they make these decisions. And, uh, under uncertainty and under risk and based on that when a certain decision fails they reevaluate it make another decision make another choice and then keep on learning from it. This is how the higher order cognitive function decision making really works and this is the, the last lecture in this series on decision making or in this whole uh, course which is of cognitive psychology. So, until we meet again thank you.